Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Welcome to the Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast, episode 23. My name's Ian. And I'm Nikki. It's been snowing. <laughs> it's great. I don't know it's if so you noticed cold. around the rest of the UK who are living in the UK, <laughs> it's been snowing. <laughs> We're cut off, aren't we? Um, well, maybe for about an hour. It was lovely. There was like no cars. Well, there was Kendall cars all queued up trying to get around the town. I didn't care about them because they okay. were going past the house. <laughs> I'd love to say I'd have had a snow day, but I live 10 minutes walk from work. <laughs> I've been to work. As- the kids had a snow day. Yeah, not fair. Yeah, they had great fun. We went sledging. We were up on the castle at 8.30 this morning with our sledges. That would be Kendall Castle. Yes. Notice how I say castle. Um, let's move I say on it from right. Very I quickly. say castle. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so this episode we've got an interview with Rachel Smith. Yes. We've got only one book review this time because we've got a movie review as well. Ooh. We've got some comic festival news. <gasps> but first, have you seen the news? Oh God, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Which because makes I don't me instantly know if you've think, seen no, I haven't. Um, about Groot. No, I the haven't. The Guardians of the Galaxy news. They're going to use a real tree? Groot's dead. What? James Gunn, the director, has officially told everybody, because it was never made clear, Groot is dead. The Ooh. number two, it's his son. It's not actually... A, it's Groot too. It's not like Groot just come back. Groot actually died. Oh. He died. But it's okay, because he left his sapling behind. Yeah, but now when you watch it again... You know that Groot, He's not just coming back. He, he, he actually died. He sacrificed himself for them. Yes. He was an amazing character. So, yeah. But thanks for that. Thanks for making that sad now when I watch it. That's Instead right. of just thinking Groot managed to repot himself. No, nope, he's dead. <sighs> Fine. Anyway, so we went to see another Marvel movie, mm-hmm. Black Panther. Yes. Um, so we weren't really bothered about seeing this, like many people back in the day when they sort of announced it. Um, mm-hmm. It sort of came out of nowhere almost because unless you've really read the comics it, it's a character yeah, that was always in the background but then the hype train got it um mainly because of all the previous films as well yeah but also the fact that it was sort of the first black lead film blade black lead blade <laughs> blade is not a superhero he is he's, he's pretty damn fine he's not a superhero that's that's i think that's the argument but i agree blade obviously was <laughs> But Blade was just featured Wesley Snipes. It didn't feature a cast of of black actors, whereas obviously Black Panther, you've got it's a cast of black ad- couple actors, of white actors, and then and Martin Freeman. Martin, <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you seen the uh, the jokes that are going around? No, you've probably everyone's heard this, but I'm going to tell Nikki. Obviously, you had, <laughs> you had Martin Freeman there, and you also had uh, Gollum. What's his yes, name? Yes, yes, you did. They, As, they, oh, what was his name? Yeah. They were. The Tolkien White Guy. Oh, I have seen that, that one. That is an amazing job. Everybody's saying it, and we're like two weeks behind. I don't care. You're probably years behind, actually. But anyway, <laughs> who cares? It was quite entertaining. Um, so the movie overall, we're not going to go into the story because no. it's, it's it's you've, you've probably all seen it. Let's be honest. Yeah, but um, some people might not have, and we're not spoiling anything. No, I mean it's it's a basic, a standard um, introduction to a character. Mm. Meeting, seeing his home world of I can't remember the, how you pronounce the home world w- now. Were you going to try it then? She's thinking Wakanda. W- well done. Yes, you know when you you know it, and then you carried on speaking. I was like, oh, maybe it's not that. <laughs> maybe I'm just going to come out, and it's going to sound awful. The world was very fully realised. I'll give it that. Oh, it was yes, gorgeous yeah. world hidden in the depths of Africa, mm. um, and it follows the, the story of. Uh, the new Black Panther again. I'm you rubbish with names, so we'll just go on. Mm-hmm. Taking over his father's mantle, yeah, who died which, in the Civil was, War. It, yeah, it led on to that, um, didn't it? In the in the film, and then the battle to hold on to this whilst a hidden family member mm. turns up to try and take over the mantle, and that is at the premise of the, the story yeah. essentially. And it's introducing all those characters within that world, mm. um, and there were some. You you had his his bodyguards or his, yeah. his, his army were all women. The warrior which women. Was, 
Bah. Very different to what we've seen awesome. before. They were awesome. Um, and they were extremely powerful. And, and let's be honest, other than him, the mm-hmm. rest of the main cast was female, mm-hmm. essentially. Yes. Which, again, is brilliant. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you agree? Yes. Uh, and so, again, that's uh, that's almost another first, for certainly for a superhero movie, mm. which is very good. Mm-hmm. You see, I'm, I know you've got things to say, so I'm, I'm not, not, I'm I'm not, not saying anything. Say. <laughs> I haven't said anything. And and the whole set and design was was flawless. Oh, yeah. As any Marvel film generally is these days. Yeah. There's been a lot of hype about the film and, and people saying it's, it's, it's an amazing film and a great mm. story. My opinion, <laughs> and I'm giving a review, it's a good film. Yes. But it is just, it's up there with the other good Marvel films, not the great Marvel films. Yeah. So it's not up there with Thor, Ragnarok, which was completely out there. Yeah. Guardians, which was completely different at the time yeah. it came out. The original Avengers, which again... Yeah, it's up there with Ant-Man. It doesn't feel like it's doing something original. No. The actual story I and the I wanted so much it. more from it. It does feel your typical superhero. Done well. Yeah. But a typical superhero movie. Yeah. Which is fine. You know, and it's it's a good film and it's it's you know the premise of Oh, you don't come away thinking, Oh god, I wish I hadn't seen no. that. No, so it's a good film. And and the fact <laughs> what it's done for black her- people and black heritage brilliant mm. and it shows well but I mean I don't understand why that shouldn't be done anyway. No, exactly. It doesn't. <laughs> it's silly. That, it, shouldn't really... that it shouldn't even be a conversation. No, <laughs> because it shouldn't. There should never be a question. What? No, of, it should just have been done without film. any. It doesn't yeah, make a difference. Exactly. <laughs> um, but obviously, it's there, and it's shown that it makes, as we all know, all the people who've got sense, colour of skin makes zero difference to whether a film's good, bad, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It just adds to the story and fits with the plots and the lines and yeah. everything that needs to be there. Yes. So, yeah. It's worth a watch. It's worth a watch. Enjoyable film, mm-hmm. but n- in our opinion, yeah, not don't, the hype. Not the hype that's that surrounding it. Yeah. Um, and I feel uh, Stan Lee's cameos are getting a bit. Bless him. He's like 120 I know, now. I know. Just leave him alone. Let him appear and leave him alone. I know. But Meanie. Bit, mm, leave Stan. him. But no. <laughs> For God, you'll miss him when he's dead. I know. Yeah. Um, one final thing on it. The final scene is mm-hmm. certainly very interesting. <gasps> oh, you what's mean the, coming. the extra scene? Yes. For what's coming f- in, in the next Avengers. Mm. Can I give a little thing? Um, well, it's it's kind no, of out there. I won't say anything, but no. it, it, it's, it could be... For what's, it's obviously what's coming in the next Avengers film, but it could also be what's coming for a future Captain America movie. That's what we'll leave it. Yes. I think it's probably more of that. Possibly. But anyway, yeah. if, you, if you're interested, you're not going to watch the film, go and look on YouTube. Yeah. Find the, out the last just, <laughs> They're all on there. It's all on there. As it's usual, we were there. sitting there, one of the only Waiting. people, whilst everyone else leaves. <laughs> yeah, but you pull that face of, tut, what, what, yeah. why are you <laughs> not here? Not true fans. <laughs> and you, who waited for the first one, but didn't wait for the second, second one. one yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> right, got a book to review. Mm-hmm. Um, perfect timing for this. Well, kind of perfect timing. Okay. Just after the Olympics y- yes. has finished, but it's also in, about to start up again. Yes. So, perfect timing for this, because it's based on North Korea. Yes. But we'll ignore the fact that Olympics in South Korea. Um, right, okay. So. You could just say the Olympics in Korea. <laughs> I'm sure Southern Korean people won't be happy that we were linking them together. Oh, yeah. oh I didn't mean like that. Do you want to give a bit of blurb? Oh, I haven't got my glasses on. Yeah. Old age. <laughs> Guy Delise is a why, a why, I can't say that because it's very hard my inflection. 37 year old French Canadian cartoonist whose work for a French animation studio requires him to oversee production at various Pacific Rim studios on the grim frontiers of free trade. His employer puts him up for months at a time in cold and soulless hotel rooms where he suffers the usual maladies of long term border cultural. And linguistic alienation. It's really hard to read these <laughs> words against the cover. It's the colours together. Anyway, there you go, people. Mm-hmm. Get colours right on the back of these books. <laughs> uh, uh, where did I get to? Cultural and linguistic alienation, boredom and cravings for Western food and real coffee. Delise depicts these sujons into the heart of isolation in the brilliant graphic no- novel Pyongyang. 
Pyong Yang. That was probably the worst <laughs> blurb reading I've ever done. Look at it. it. Can you see what I mean? I can see what you mean. It's yellow it's, it's on got... like a green. Uh, green. I've lost the ability to see colour now. On a brownie colour, it just doesn't. It blurs together. Have you finished now? I've finished okay. whinging about my incompetence. Yes. <laughs> so after that, what is the the book about? I don't know. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> it's about <laughs> it's about this guy um staying in North Korea uh, for a few months. Um and it's his his take on what he sees, what he's allowed to see. Mm-hmm. Um I mean he he barely scratches the surface of North Korea, but it opens up a very odd place. It was very very interesting this book. Just seeing cuz he stays in a hotel that, that foreign people can stay in one of three hotels in korea and he was staying in one but korea i mean I'd, when was this done it's only a few years ago wasn't it, it wasn't uh, that long ago was it 2003 or something was it that far? i didn't realize it was that long ago yeah 2003 okay it was quite um, a while ago and so where he was staying they korea didn't have enough electricity so all the lights go out at night so the cars just have to they have no street lights no nothing um, you don't see old people, disabled people, anything like that, because they don't exist in North Korea. Um, it was he had to be followed around constantly by a guide and his um, interpreter, mm-hmm. but then he wasn't allowed to go out of the building without these two people with him, and he wasn't allowed to visit anywhere. I mean, he was taken to the sites that he was supposed to be taken to, it's like shrines a muse- and yeah, a museum, museum. And- and you know, and it's it's things where he's looking out, and they they're building up an opera, aren't they, across the way? And there was um, rousing tunes being sung at them mm. to keep the workers working. So it, it's very indoctrinated, and it's it's very odd. But it does also show that it was um, the Koreans that said we have to do the ten thousand steps a day. So you know, saying nothing doesn't mean he's right, but you know, might might drop down might to be. eight thousand now <laughs> and rebel. <laughs> it's I mean. We all, I'd like to think, most of us think what what's going on in North Korea. It's such an odd. It's place. completely separate. They've even got a different. They even their years are different to us. Yeah, based and, on the their the, yeah. the leaders, isn't it? Yeah, and also they changed their clocks. So they're even though I mean they're attached to Korea. I mean South Korea, and North Korea, they're they're all attacked, but they're an hour different. It's <laughs> a strange place, and you can it, it, he questions all the way throughout what. Why are these people doing this? Why are they living this life? Mm. Are they thinking what's going on in the side of the world? Or, or, they can or... get a lot of money by dropping in neighbours and everything. Yeah, it's weird. So, you know... And there's no disabled people as well. No, that's what I said, yeah. yeah they think they're all in... Odd... There's supposedly re-education camps to the north of Korea. That's probably where, where you know, it's... if you're seen as going against the regime you're sent there to be re-educated. But I reckon they're probably just like work camps Possibly. and to hide people they don't want to be seen. It sounds like an awful place. But still, I'm in- I'd love to- I'd actually be intrigued to visit in I a know. weird way. No. I would. No, because but... it's far too linear and conformist mm. and I'd have to do something naughty. <laughs> I mean, he did something slightly <laughs> naughty, but like <laughs> he kept throwing paper airplanes out, didn't he? Yeah. He went See, to the train station when he wasn't meant yeah, to. Yeah, it wasn't meant like to. That. And the train station, because all these things as well, they're, they're de- designed to withstand nuclear mm. attacks. So the train station could withstand a nuclear attack. And lots of other places where he visited. But wasn't the train station, wasn't it absolutely... It was just normal. Like a, was it normal? Was it the palatial one? No, it was just normal. There was nothing... He didn't understand why, why he, he wasn't go. allowed to go and see it. It was it was boring. It wasn't interesting. It was... Yeah. It, it's odd. It and obviously... They, it, they they have to have a lot of of aid sent to them because they are struggling, you know, um, food. Which they shouldn't be. No, they shouldn't be. But yeah, and all this. But they also are realising that, I mean, this is them opening up their borders as far as they're concerned, letting these mm. people come in. And living in this one little place. One of three hotels allowed uh, to live on, on a floor of the hotel. Okay, maybe we'll stick to South Korea. We'll, we'll <laughs> yeah, I'd love to go to South Korea. <laughs> right, brilliant. So that is... Pyongyang. Yes. I can't say it. I can't say anything for him, can I? You make it sound like it's a ping pong. <laughs> by um, A Journey in North Korea by Guy Delisle. Oh, is it Delisle? I said Delise. 
It's one of them. It's Delisle. There'll be there'll be a link on the on the. Uh... No, you're right. It's Delisle. Yeah. I just can't read. I That's can't fine. read today. That's fine. Uh, so now we've got an interview with Rachel Smith, mm-hmm. um, who whose comic Wired at Wrong, as we explained, just did phenomenal stuff on mm. on Kickstarter, crazy amounts of money. Um, so have a listen to that, enjoy, and then we'll come back with some festival news. Mm. Mike's mutterings. Hello and welcome again. This past week we've been entertaining guests and for anyone looking at my Twitter feed you may think we spent the whole week playing Dungeons & Dragons. Well basically we did but we also watched an awful lot of awful films and swapped both comic books and comic book recommendations. And I found some serious gems of comic series but one really stood out this week. With International Women's Day coming up on Thursday the 8th of March, the series that I've chosen to talk about is the incredibly apt Bitch Planet. Seriously, you'll have to bear with me and I promise to explain both the title and the premise. This 2014 series is the brainchild of Kelly Sue DeConnick and Valentine Delandro. Kelly took the scriptwriting duties for the series and has previously won plaudits for her work on Captain Marvel, but it was her superb mystical western series Pretty Deadly that made me such a fan. Delandro is the artist for the series and I know his work from The X Factor so I knew that I was in for a treat. DeConnick and Delandro have come up with a very dystopian future view. One controlled by the fathers who inflict extreme patriarchy on the population. Women are subjugated and gender is forced binary. Principally a story of feminism and sexual revolution, it's also a world of race politics and people of colour trying to escape a second class status. Women and trans people who fail to conform or be compliant are shipped to prison facilities, some being off-world. And it's such an off-world auxiliary compliance outpost, aka bitch planet, that is the setting for this story. The real genius of this series though are all the inappropriate movie genres they use to tell the story. The cover art evokes all the best elements of grindhouse video posters. 70s sexploitation films of women behind bars like Caged Heat or Big Dollhouse are perfectly captured uh, in the look and feel with subtitles like Girl Gangs! and Caged and Enraged! As the women arrive at the prison, there's even the obligatory shower scene. So, to use this to drive a story of feminist revolt doesn't look like it should work but it really does and in a wonderful way the story initially follows two main characters both inmates the principal character Cameron Koga is a former athlete who has a hidden agenda for being sent there and is quickly established as someone who basically protects the the weaker then there's the story of Penny Roll whose backstory is explored a lot more in detail Having been originally fostered by the state, her continued rebellion to non-compliant attitude, her weight and her body image have led her here. Cameron is approached by the facility to put together the first ever women's team to participate in the Jumila sport, the current drug of the masses. This is where prison sports films like V for Victory, Mean Machine and Death Race start to blend with future sport films like Rollerball and Salute of the Jugger to influence the script even further and you get a real genre mashup. The game Dumila, known to the American audience as Megaton, seems simple enough. Think of a, a five-a-side football pitch with very tall sides but shorter end zones. The players basically score by throwing a small medicine ball over the end zone wall or in the corner pockets. Each team can have any number of players up to a maximum of £2,000 in weight and it's basically a huge one-on-one grapple and fight. Designed to placate the masses, the first on-screen death spiked viewing figures so the ladies are looking more and more like a cheap sacrifice for ratings. Following the prison sport movie trope, Cameron sets out together a a tough team of characters to both play the game and also survive the system together. There you have all these clashing movie tropes, and as more gets added, you obviously wonder how this comes together to be a feminist agenda tour de force. Well, one reason is the attention to detail in the scripting and art. It really drags you into this world of all-pervading misogyny. From holographic AI systems represented by obvious male fantasy lingerie-clad figures, to the subtlety of language used by corporate white males to denigrate the women around them. 
and for women to step out of this expected cultural norm of the stay-at-home wife who devotes herself to her husband's demands would be to invite some serious consequences. Between chapters, the novel includes excerpts from things like The Compliant Woman's Weekly, as an example of the mainstream propaganda machine that promotes a single perfect body image and pushes an obsession with slimness and dangerous diets. All these little things help the reader understand the extreme nature of the prevailing patriarchal society that these characters have to inhabit. Artist Delandro also has the perfect eye for drawing the every man and every woman, and capturing those little micro-expressions. From the dead eyes of a man not caring to the smirkness of a person condescending another. And this is key to realising some of the most impactful scenes. One such is the nonchalant way that a security guard notes the trespassing from some young black kids and orders them eliminated, and the boredom in his eyes as he doesn't even look up to his monitor to confirm their deaths. There's also a deliberate play with panel layout and dark and light colours to differentiate between the controlling classes and the subjugated classes. It makes it one of those books that's definitely worth a reread, just so you can capture exactly what's going on. With Bitch Planet, DeConnick and Delandro have successfully merged Pulpy Grindhouse with Clever and Political. I actually read reviews when this was first released that complained that it had too many messages and too much was brought in too early and it was all a bit of a mess, but to me, that clash of genres and the overload of messages is the beauty of the series. It was even nominated for an Eisner Best Writer Award in 2014. To date, it has two collected volumes and last year a standalone collection of Bitch Planet short stories from some amazing writers and artists. It allowed some amazingly cool writers to explain in more detail some of the many forms of oppression of the, of the Bitch Planet dystopia and there's some really inventive short stories there. The prescience of Bitch Planet cannot be denied. Written two years before the release of the Trump recording on his views of women and the rise of the extreme hard right and the erosion of gay and trans rights, to read it right now at this moment given the multitude of messages they just resonate so much in a time when the top hashtags are women's march me too black lives matter he for she fem too born this way trans rights then you basically see that it's a graphic novel that cannot be more relevant to the here and now hopefully the next arc of the main story will begin again this year But till then, the first two volumes will deserve another read-through or two from me. So let's get straight into this. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Um, So let's go back in the past. When did you start reading or did you read comics as a kid? I did. Uh, I used to love uh, Sonic the Comic when I was a kid. Um, ah. Yeah, I remember That's my dad. That's the first time I've had that. It is actually. Isn't really? It? Yeah. I remember my dad buying me them like, on the way home from school, and then I'd get in and just lie on the living room carpet and try and copy all the pictures. I, yeah, I, lo- yeah. I loved Sonic. <laughs> I loved all the Sonic games and stuff, so that was amazing for me. He's, he's um, quite an easy character to draw in some way, is he? Yeah, unless yeah. you have to draw him like from the back. I don't think I ever drew him. That's why I'm trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> so you liked the Sonic games as well? Yes, yeah, I did. I was in love with Sonic when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, that's embarrassing. But um, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that was my first sort of foray into comics, and then I sort of fell out with comics a little bit. Um, I kind of had a lot of. Uh, sorry, can you hear that? My cat is having trouble it's, with it. Oh, don't worry. We, we have cat, we have problems. cat problems too. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like, he's. I've, we've lived in this house for like nearly three years and he's still not worked out the cat problem. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, I loved all the Sonic games and stuff. And then I kind of fell out with comics a little bit um, in sort of college and that. I think I just had a lot of prejudices about them. I thought they were just superheroes and that really mm-hmm. didn't turn me on at all. Um, and then it wasn't until I was like 23 when the Scott Pilgrim's books came out okay. and the penny sort of dropped for me there. And I was like, oh, it's just 
a, a way of telling a story. Comics can be about anything. Mm-hmm. And then just from reading those, just never really looked back. I was like, I, I like drawing and I like telling stories. I could do both of these things. <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> so did you do that sort of artwork at college or anything or was it completely separate? It was kind of separate. I did sort of fine art at university. Okay. Uh, so I was drawing and stuff, but it was more kind of conceptual. It wasn't really sort of sequential storytelling at all. Mm. Um, but yeah, obviously the drawing, the sort of life drawing was a good foundation for for later. But yeah, I'd, I'd just not really considered uh, comics until a bit later in life. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how did you get into actually creating comics? Did you manage to, to self-publish initially or...? Yeah, I started very small. Um, I used to do my diary comic, One Good Thing, uh, which I just put online. Um, and I did that every day. Uh, it was when I sort of the first time I kind of uh, dealt with uh, depression. So mm-hmm. I used to try and draw like a positive thing that had happened to me every day mm-hmm. and either make that into a little comic or do like a big one big drawing. Um, so I did that. And then I used to print those sort of month to month. So I'd collect a month together and sell it as a little mini comic and yeah start going to shows and meeting people just yeah I, I started very small but but yeah <laughs> kind of got into it that way um the first time we saw your work was the rabbit yes um okay cool Avery Hilton, is mm-hmm. That. Mm-hmm. what was the idea behind the story of that is a particular uh, I always find these questions weird because I don't <laughs> really know where they come from <laughs> just my weird brain I suppose but um (laughs) yeah the rabbit I I knew I wanted to tell a story about two sisters Mm -hmm. and I had a very clear picture of what they looked like in my head and that they and just from sort of the first glimpse of them that people would think that they something wasn't quite right that that they were in trouble somehow Mm -hmm. um and then I've no idea where Craig came from really um sorry Craig is the, the giant rabbit, the from, rabbit. <laughs> but um yeah I just and and I started draw- I knew it was going to be them and this big monster type thing I can't remember when he became a rabbit but um but I knew at one point I wanted him to have Kanye shades and a feather boa on so I just wrote I just wrote that in uh <laughs> somehow but yeah the rabbit was um it's a bit of an anomaly. I mean, it, it's sort of more fantastical than my other stories. My stories tend to be quite slice of life. And and while the rabbit is still very character driven, it, it is a bit more sort of a bit scary and a bit fantastical, mm. I suppose. It, it doesn't go down a path you expect, that's for sure. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> did you do a bit of Doctor Who as well? Did I read that right? I did. I um, used to do the uh, backup strips for the 10th Doctor comics. Okay. Um, and but the backup strips are uh, but it's just a page at the back of the of the single issues, mm. uh, which is just like a one off story. They're either one or two pages, um, and they're just like funny little throwaway jokes, really. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. I did that for about three years. How um, did you find having to use a character that's already created for you? It was strange. Um, yeah. I mean, and I had to do a lot of research because I I'd never really been a Doctor Who fan when I was growing up. Um, <laughs> oh, so to, oh, is this us yeah, stopping this okay. interview? I've admitted before on on shows, but uh, but yeah, so I I basically when I got the gig, I just binge watched like whole box sets of it, and like my at the time would come home and she'd be like, "Is this just your job now?" I was like, "Yeah, I guess so." <laughs> <laughs> just watch you go do. Um, but it was good. I mean, luckily I enjoyed the show. I was like, what if I hate it? And I yeah. like, <laughs> stories, but you know, I'd, I'd heard good things. Uh, so <laughs> it was good. Um, the, I mean, the most challenging thing for me with those strips wasn't necessarily the fact that I was playing with someone else's toys. It was getting like a whole story into one page. Mm. I mean, you, you probably noticed in the rabbit, I, I do give my characters a lot of space on the page. And if, mm-hmm. And I tend to use splash pages quite a lot if I think a moment is, you know, uh, important. But with mm. Doctor Who, you know, you, it, I ended up with these monstrous, like, 23-panel scripts. And I was like, I can't <laughs> I can't put 23 panels on a page. <laughs> so the, the writing of them was really difficult at first. I think I got better at it. Uh, but, yeah. Um, but it, it was good. It, it meant that it was challenging me in a different way. It was using different muscles mm. of, you know, uh, comic-making muscles it was it was a challenge but it was fun and and working with doctor who i mean that's opened a lot of doors for me that's yeah 
you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Wired Up Wrong. Mm-hmm. Before we go into the actual book itself, the deluxe edition, yep. how, how much did that make on Kickstarter? Uh, nearly 12 and a half grand, I think. Yeah. Were you expecting anything <laughs> like that? I mean, so I I was asking for six grand. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I kickstarted House Party, my first graphic novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kickstarted that like in 2002. 12 or something like that uh, a little while ago and that made just over four grand I think so I was like okay. well I've got a bigger audience now I'll... so I, I knew that I would probably make the six grand mm-hmm. um, I didn't think that we'd make double that <laughs> like, yeah it was it, it was pretty overwhelming and it felt like it kind of got away from me very quickly like mm-hmm. people were I was getting orders from you know other side of the world like I'd never even done a convention there you know and I was just like, okay, this is this is bigger than I even thought it was going to be. But it was it was overwhelming, but it, it was awesome. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So the fact it wasn't even a it was an extension of the book you'd already had released as well, wasn't it? So yeah, it uh, makes I mean, it even more special. Small... The fact that it's 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 already been out there mm. and it's still this big. It's brilliant. Yeah, with the first edition, I only did like a small print run, so I, it was more just a a silly little thing I did so that I'd have something new at Thought Bubble, but then they they sold out like super quick and people were saying that it really helped them and Mm -hmm. that it helped their partners like understand their depression and stuff and all these good reviews. So I was like, oh, okay, this isn't just a fun little thing. (laughs) This is like actually quite helpful for people. Mm -hmm. So that spurred the kind of, right, I, I, instead of just getting it reprinted, I'll just add a bunch more pages and get it done really nice and so yeah so that's how that came about so how was it for yourself sort of creating a comic like this and sort of putting your heart and soul into it in some way I suppose it's quite uh, it's quite cathartic putting it down on the page Mm. um but then sometimes a little bit hard like it was hard Mm. to tell the uh, all things considered story which is like a mini story within within the book yeah. and it was hard to draw some of the pages that I knew my mum would read and be upset by <laughs> um so in that way it was a little bit tough sometimes but uh I kind of I just I wanted to kind of I wanted it to be a very honest book mm-hmm. and I think it's a better book because because of that yeah I think when it's when you read it you see points even if you don't suffer Mm-hmm. You still see points within a book that yeah. you relate to oh, yeah. in, in some way, shape, or form. I do. That you have those. Well, you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in fact, there's points yeah, where... Yeah, that's you with your anxiety, <laughs> Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of people that... Uh, uh, well, in fact, I've only taken the deluxe edition to one show, mm. uh, True Believers, a couple of weeks ago. But, um, yeah, so many people bought it and then came back to me later in the day just going, this is me, <laughs> and yeah. I do this, and this is me also. And I was just... <laughs> like, like I did the book, and I genuinely thought people would read it and sort of go, oh, "Rachel's a bit weird." But <laughs> so many people have read it and just been like, "No, this is you're literally not on your own. This is <laughs> this is but so much me." That's so. nice though to know <laughs> that there's loads of you, loads of us all together. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's why it's done so well. It, people read it and they feel less alone, and mm. you know, like like it's not all hope isn't lost because. You know, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> it must make you feel better in yourself, though, knowing knowing that you're sort of giving some comfort to people. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. that's it, it's amazing when people come and say this has really helped me, and and I I never like I I love it when people tell me things like that. I never really know what to do with that information though, because I'm just like, you know, I'm I'm also nobody. Like I <laughs> I'm not a doctor or anything. <laughs> I know nothing, but. But, you know, I guess, yeah, I think it's the honesty that people really, really like yeah. about the book. So, yeah. <laughs> I suppose then the, the feeling is there should be more stories like this, or there should be more stories, especially to kids mm. in schools, maybe. Um, maybe, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's getting better, but it still is kind of a taboo subject in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, which is really silly and and quite damaging, I think, when yeah. people aren't really sure what's happening with their brain. Mm. Um, so yeah, but I I hope in you know my own small way that I'm I'm helping that. And and if one person reads 
wired it wrong and then decides, hey, OK, I'm, I am going to go to the doctor and have that conversation, then it, it, it will all have been worth it. I mean, mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you, have you got any plans for other books at the minute? Is there any anything in pipeline similar to why yeah, the wrong uh, going a completely different way? Um, it'll be another made up story. Mm-hmm. Um, again, maybe, yeah, a little bit fantastical. It's got a witch in it. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm, I don't know how much I could tell you because it's not been really announced <laughs> yet, but I, I do have a publisher for it and stuff. So it is going to happen probably mm-hmm. spring next year. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but I'm sure I'll I'll be chatting about that on my Twitter and stuff soon. <laughs> That's what, with with Ride It Wrong though, you went you went self published with that, didn't you? Yeah, I with did, the rabbit Avery and I Hill. did that. The rabbit and artificial flowers were Avery mm-hmm. Hill. House Party was Great Beast, mm-hmm. which was kind of an art, arts collective rather okay. than a publisher. Um, and yeah, Wired It Wrong was self published. Um, I think because it was such a personal project, and I wanted to crowdfund it by myself because I wanted uh sorry I'm not explaining this very well I wanted the people that backed the project to feel they were a part of the making of it Mm -hmm. I wanted it to kind of be a a sort of collective effort if you know what I mean yeah um and I just felt it it is such a personal book it made sense to just do it by myself um but yeah (laughs) so do you not feel you'd want to do that down the line or do you you prefer the publishing route or I suppose it's a bit when you've got the backing of a publisher, it does help, I suppose. Uh, self-publishing again, or like mm-hmm. an yeah. autobio comic. Just self-publishing at all. Um, I think it's, I would probably do it for, if I wanted to do a smaller thing. Mm. I think I, and I mean, self-publishing is really useful when you're starting out as well, because yeah. you kind of get a feel of all the different jobs that are involved in making a comic. Uh, whereas with a publisher, they will take a lot of that work off of you. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, I think maybe for a smaller things like my flimsy books, I'll probably always just, you know, get a small run of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but largely I think for my big sort of more ambitious projects, it's nice to have a publisher behind me, mm. uh, just cause I get to spend more time drawing and writing. <laughs> Selfish <laughs> like that. <laughs> and not, I'm not doing those promotional stuff and all that sort of the boring bit of the job. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's always that involved, like, you know, making sure you're on social media yeah. and t- and you've got to be open to do interviews and and stuff like this guys um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll always be involved but it's just nice having someone else to sort of sort yeah. out distribution and marketing and, yeah. and getting it into shops and yeah stuff like that i'm i'm not sort of naturally very good at those kind of things so i'd rather be i'd rather be drawing <laughs> do you enjoy doing conventions i do yeah um well, it gets me out of the house, doesn't well, it? Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> so, I mean, luckily, I I live uh, with my boyfriend Adam, who is also a comic creator, and we share a studio. But mm. other than that, I it's I don't really meet people, <laughs> so going to shows is really good to sort of uh, meet the people who read your books and, yeah. and you can see firsthand that that you're doing something right because people are saying oh I love this and yeah. you know getting you to sign, sign the books and stuff so yeah I love that I love meeting the, the fans and sort of uh, and meeting my peers as well you know there's a lot of comic creators that I only ever see at shows because yeah. we're, we're scattered around the UK um so yeah no I, lo- I love shows <laughs> and they're all sat at home not chatting to anybody <laughs> that's it isn't it yeah <laughs> everyone's sat alone. <laughs> Um, so what, what convention are you doing this year then? Oh, yeah, I should have prepared for this yeah. question. Um, <laughs> I'm doing uh, Scythe in April. That's the Cardiff Indie Comic Expo. <laughs> I'm doing one in Oldham and one... I'm doing Thought Bubble, which yeah. is my favourite. Um, always Thought Bubble, if they let me in, which they always have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, pro- I'll probably try and get a table for MCM Manchester. Um, yeah, I've I've got a few. Leamington They're Spa. They're all in the UK because I know it's that pop up the other day. Leamington Spa. Leamington Spa. <laughs> oh, Leamington Spa. Yeah, I'm doing that one. Yep. <laughs> <It's sad. laughs> the things you pop when you when you <laughs> scrolling through Twitter, you just see it all pop up. Yeah. <laughs> um. So just quickly back to Kickstarter before we finish okay. the interview. 
because mm-hmm. that one was so successful, have you got any tips for sort of would-be creators who want to drive their, their projects um, through Kickstarter? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard work, but if you can put the time in to the promotion, like for that month, so Kickstarters have to just be a month. They can be less, but I mm-hmm. do mind for a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just preparing stuff, like getting you know, asking people on podcasts if they'll have you on while your campaign is live. And um, and I did leaflets, which I sent out to shops, asking very nicely if they'll put them on the counter for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did, I tried to do a couple of shows during that month where I, you know, le- leafleted and, and talked to people about the project. Um, trying to get people to feature your campaign on, you know, look at sort of comic press websites and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Broken Frontier are very good at pushing kickstarters and i think forbidden planet used to have like uh a, a kick a sort of crowdfunding thing that they d- did whether they still do but um yeah just keep an eye out for things like that and um yeah just try and be a bit prepared and when your project goes live i would say definitely just don't have anything else that you've got on that day just be on social media <laughs> asking answering questions and yeah people will ask really stupid questions so be there for, for them and <laughs> for the special yeah, people that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's all i got i think um yeah, yeah. No, that's cool i mean um, i'm very lucky and I, i've been doing it for a little while so i knew mm-hmm. i kind of had had that audience mm. but yeah um yeah <laughs> just be available <laughs> Uh, so where can people find the information about you You've got on Twitter and, and the website? Yeah, my website's just rachelsmith.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, Rachel with an underscore at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, ev- everything's on the website, really, including my appearances, which I could not remember <laughs> before. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's superb, Rachel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do. Welcome to Breakdowns, the comic art section of the podcast. I'm Pete Taylor. I'm a small press comics creator and illustrator. Online, I trade as This Man, This Pete. And my favourite thing I've drawn since last episode is a big pile of Copperopolis pages. Very pleased with them. They're they're for the Kickstarter I'm involved in. Um, It's nearing completion. I finished all my pages of artwork. I've just got a couple of pages left to letter and package it all up for the printers and I will of course spread the word here when the comic is available to purchase. First a quick apology. My Jack Kirby profiles have been very sporadic of late and there's been big gaps between them which kind of defeats the object so I will concentrate on finishing my examination of the king's life for the next few episodes. Uh, A quick roundup in episode 11 We covered the birth, childhood and early career of Kirby. Episode 13 saw the start of the Simon and Kirby partnership and their first big hit, Captain America. And episode 16 explored Jack's wartime exploits. If you remember, we had covered up to the summer of 1947 in Jack's life. Simon and Kirby had created the new romance genre for Crestwood Publishing and they had started their own studio to fulfil demand. In 1949, things were great for the partnership. Money from their romance comics line allowed the Kirby family to move to a brand new home in Long Island, New York, where they would live for the next 20 years. Jack would spend most of his time in the basement studio, which was christened The Dungeon. Sales of their flagship title, Young Romance, were selling over 1 million copies per issue, but never once to rest on their laurels, the team continued to try other genres and subject matters. 1950 saw the pair launch two new titles, Boys Ranch, the much-lauded Kid Western for Harvey Comics, which only lasted six issues, and Black Magic, published by Prize, which proved more popular, ending a decade later after 50 issues. Now, Here we need to take a little detour and explore the state of the comics industry at this time. 
In the early 1950s, comics was not in a good place. They were under attack. The very first comics were reprinted comic strips from newspapers. Newspaper strips or funnies and their creators were trusted, admired and respected. You could argue that was mainly because adults read them, supplied as they were inside their mature publications. One of Will Eisner's early successes was built upon realising that this resource would eventually run dry and new content would be needed. When the newly formed comics industry started supplying kids with their own cheap form of sequential entertainment, they were largely viewed with suspicion by parents and educators. Here's an editorial from 1940 printed in the Chicago Daily News. Badly drawn, badly written and badly printed. A strain on the young eyes and young nervous systems. The effects of these pulp paper nightmares is that of a violent stimulant. Their crude blacks and reds spoils a child's natural sense of colour. Their hypodermic injection of sex and murder make the child impatient with better though quieter stories. Unless we want a coming generation even more ferocious than the present one, parents and teachers throughout America must band together to break the comic magazine. DC reacted early, and from 1941 they formed editorial boards with psychiatrists, child welfare experts and well-respected citizens, showing that their books were responsibly prepared and trustworthy entertainment. Concern continued, however, and in 1948, Frederick Wortham, a noted child psychiatrist, was interviewed in Collier's magazine and came out publicly against comic books. The article was titled, Horror in the Nursery. Wortham's impact on the comic community wouldn't end here. In the early 1950s, the most sensational publisher of parentally worrisome comic books was EC Comics. Founded by William Gaines and originally known as Educational Comics, it specialised in Bible story adaptations. The company radically changed direction and its fortunes under his son, Max Gaines. Now branded as Entertaining Comics, EC published distinctly outrageous and successfully selling series. Their horror comics included Tales from the Crypt and Haunt of Fear and featured gruesome tales with ironically appropriate fates befalling the protagonists. The war stories in Frontline Combat and Two-Fisted Tales were not in keeping with the patriotic tone of the times and featured world-weary, sometimes unheroic leads. These tales were put together by a stellar cast of talent, including Harvey Kurtzman, Wally Wood, Frank Rosetta, Joe Orlando, Al Williamson and many more. It's perhaps no surprise that this irreverent and sensationalist approach also led to them publishing a humour title called Mad. Back to Jack. In September 1953, there is an announcement that a US Senate subcommittee will convene to hold hearings into the possible harmful effects that comics may have on children and young people. It is at this point that Simon and Kirby decide to set up a new comic book publishing company. It would seem the worst possible time to do this, but it's more understandable when other factors are taken into account. Comic book publishers were being affected by the backlash against them, and many were folding and going out of business. This, in turn, led to less work for printers. Joe Simon later recounted, The printers grew frantic. It was a necessity of their business that the presses keep running. When the presses were silent, printing companies still had to pay overhead so they were, they were more than willing to back a new comics organisation if it showed promise. Add into this situation that the pair had started to suspect that Crestwood was not honouring their arrangement over royalty payments, and that this was the direction that both ultimately wanted to take. They aspired to have their own line of self-published books. They called their new publishing venture Mainline. Subletting studio pe- space off Harvey Comics... And to give their new venture a small safety net, they continued to work for Crestwood. The first four titles were Bullseye, Western Scout, the war comic Foxhole, In Love and Police Trap, a crime comic reportedly based on real-life stories from law enforcement officers. Roz Kirby later said that Bullseye and Foxhole were particularly close to Jack's heart and he would have happily drawn them for the rest of his career. 
but Jack never seems to get these breaks, does he? In April 1954, Seduction of the Innocent by Frederick Wortham was published and had the most devastating effect on the comic book industry. In this book, Dr. Wortham stated that in his studies with children, he found comic books to be a major cause of juvenile delinquency and worse. His accusations included that they were being taught the wrong ideas about the laws of physics because Superman could fly. Batman and Robin were encouraging homosexual thoughts, not just because of their close relationship, but also because Robin was always drawn with bare legs. And Wonder Woman, according to Wortham, confused little girls about a woman's proper place in society. Wow. The US Senate convened a hearing to investigate these concerns. Wortham had been working on these accusations for some time and performed well on the witness stand. The hearings were televised and members of the public watched in their millions. Famed newspaper strip cartoonists such as Walt Kelly and Milton Kenniff testified that there was no real relationship between their industry and this ugly cousin called comic books. Most of the witnesses from the major comic publishers were not on the editorial side and so were very vague with their answers. Most of the images used in the hearing were reproduced from EC Comics, so perhaps appropriately, William Gaines was the highest profile representative from the comics industry to take the stand. His opening statement was out of touch with the times and the mood of the proceedings, but it has since been remembered as a thoughtful defence of creative freedom. His performance under questioning, though, wasn't as admired, and Gaines was portrayed in the national press as an amoral publisher who would use the most grotesque images possible to sell comics. The committee concluded that a competent job of self-policing within the industry will achieve much. Forced into self-governance, 26 publishers of comic books came together to form the Comics Code Authority. The list of things now prohibited in comic books included depictions of excessive violence and lurid, unsavoury, gruesome illustrations. Supernatural creatures such as vampires, werewolves, ghouls and zombies could not be portrayed. And one rule was introduced that seemed especially aimed at E.C. and William Gaines. Comics could not use the words terror or horror in their titles. Meanwhile, in September 1954, Simon and Kirby had Cresswood's books audited and found that the company owed them 130000 in unpaid royalty payments. Cresswood tell the pair they would shut down the company if they pursued the case. Joe and Jack are reportedly forced to settle for $10,000. Gaines tried to work within the system, but all of his reworked comics proved unprofitable and were cancelled the year following the code's introduction. All except MAD, which was converted to a magazine because the code did not apply to that format and survives to this day. The collapse of EC Comics led to their distributor, Leader News, also going under. This was awful news for Simon and Kirby, as Leader News was also the distributor of mainline comics. This seems to have been the last straw for the team. They sell any unpublished material they have to Charlton Comics, and after nearly 15 years together dissolve their partnership. Jules Pfeiffer, in his book The Great Comic Book Heroes, wrote the following tribute to the pair. The team of Simon and Kirby brought anatomy back into comic books. Not that other artists didn't draw well, but no one could put quite as much anatomy into a hero as Simon and Kirby. Muscles stretched magically, foreshortened and shockingly, Legs were never less than four feet apart when a punch was thrown. Every panel was a population explosion. Casts of thousands, all fighting, falling, crawling. Speed was the thing. Rocking, uproarious speed. Thanks for listening. Apologies for any mangling of names in this profile. Please return next episode as I continue Jack's story and his return to the company that would become Marvel Comics. If you're interested in further reading about this period of Jack's life, go read Young Romance, the best of Simon and Kirby's romance comics. There are two volumes available from Fantagraphic Books, and the first volume is available on Comixology. If you're interested in reading any of my comics, 
My preview issue of Monster Kids and other titles are now listed in my online store, thispeak.bigcartel.com, link on my website. You can find me at thismanthispeak on Instagram and Twitter. Email me at thismanthispeak at gmail.com or at my website, thismanthispeak.com. How are we getting on with the comic, Nikki? I've done a page. You've done a page. Because I'm waiting for someone else to print off the bits for well, me. Well, there is other bits there you could use if you wanted to just do the three pairs. I, you know, I, I but... would like to follow in a linear fashion. Okay. Okay. So um, don't look at me like that. I had to wait for this script. Okay. Which was then waffled in front of me. So I'm we're not going very far. Tomorrow. <laughs> don't say it like that. I had to wait ages for your poxy script. <laughs> what do you mean poxy? For intellectual, I'll have you know. It's really not. <laughs> like, interpreting your ideas. I didn't realise. Oh, my God. Having <laughs> I'm interviewed, a diva, okay. Excuse me. Having interviewed so many artists, you know, I felt we could have more of an open <laughs> as opposed to me being very strict <laughs> in my writing. I, I felt know, some kind. Of, well, I, I liked your ideas of, like, direction. I, I felt we were more mm. like Brubaker and Phillips as opposed to two that had never met before, you know. <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's fine. There you I'm go. being perfectly civil. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm working on it tomorrow, and unless the kids are off school, then I'm going to make a snowman instead. <laughs> do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> yes. Disney will probably do us for that now, but I should yeah. delete. <laughs> delete. Delete that. Get it off. <laughs> right. Festival news. For all you creators out there. <gasps> There's still <laughs> space at the festival this year because they have opened it up. It's bigger, bigger and better. Bigger and better. Yes, there's more space for you all. Uh, so if you're interested, go and have a look on the website. Um, you can email, when I find it, carol, C-A-R-O-L-E, mm-hmm. at comicfestival.com um, with a form that's that's on the website to get yourself linked in there and, and, mm-hmm. and join in the fun. The fun. Sell the merch. Yes, meet us. Meet well, yeah. <laughs> That's to a fair, point. You don't have to pay and stuff to meet us. You know, it's, it's free of charge. <laughs> I'll be honest. In fact, I'll pay you to make you look like you're interested. <laughs> right. The other news. I'm going to try something now with the effects on here. Oh, please stop twiddling the effects. your effects. There, we oh, are what? echoing. <laughs> we are echoing. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can't hear it echoing. <laughs> The Lex International Comic Art Festival tickets for the 2018 festival are available now. Uh, I'll, I'll, Have you quite finished? I'll turn that off now. Yeah, please there we, do. There yeah. we go. Yeah, you've done it's it. off now. Yeah. yeah. You're not allowed to have effects. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're available on the website now. Yes, go get them. Um, early bird tickets mm. this time. I'll be honest, I'm not sure on the date when the early bird's being cut off, but you save money by buying them now. Yes. So, early bird weekend pass is £30, or kids £20. Mm-hmm. The Friday pass is £20. Now, we've not heard anything about this, and Go I'm on. actually very intrigued. Go on. They have a Friday pass. <gasps> Do they get to come and They've never hang out with us lot? <laughs> Friday pass before. <laughs> it was previously just for the evening entertainment. Yes. So, Friday Gala opening night, eight pound as per usual, five pound mm-hmm. for concessions. Mm-hmm. Saturday pass twenty two pounds, Sunday pass nineteen pounds, or a full pass three day festival pass forty five pounds. There is three days, people. Three days. There's more going on. Yes. That we didn't even know about. <laughs> <laughs> so Tickets are available now at comicartfestival.com. Later on this week, they will be start announcing the lineup. Um, yes, they're going to drip feed us with these goodies. So expect an official announcement any day now from when this is released. Mm-hmm. It's getting exciting. We have heard a few names. We have. And we likey. We likey lutzy. We, we, we need interviews. Oh, yes. <laughs> and hugs. Hugs. Like, yeah. 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 There's one... 
group of three people that we really need to sit and chat to. Mm. One of them we've chatted to previously, but we Ooh. need to sit and chat to a group of three. We'll leave it at that. Yes, don't say any more. I'm not going to because I get slapped. <laughs> and also, I can't think who it might be. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I've had a hard day. <laughs> right, so we'll have more on that next time. Mm-hmm. We should have some music on the next episode as well. Oh yes. From from a a, a metal yes. band. Rock, rock on, is that, Dan- is that rock, your rock rocking on face? Rock on, Danielson. Is is that was that it? Yeah. Was that your rocking on? Is That's it because me. you have no hair anymore and you can't mosh it? Only because I like to keep it short and snazzy. Okay, that's the reason. Thank you very much for listening. We will be back on the fifteenth of March. I know the year is setting off now. Yes, it's all kicking off. We'll have yeah. obviously a lineup information then, mm-hmm. unless something goes wrong. No, it should be fine. No, otherwise, the snow might continue. Snowpocalypse. Oh, I might have got fed up with it by then. Yeah, There's only so right. many Pikachu snowmen I can build. You've not built one yet. I what have. are you on about? I've got pictures. It looks like you've killed something when there it when it starts melting after you paint the cheeks. A frazzled Pikachu. <laughs> I'm not sure poster paint's the best way, but no. it works. Okay. okay. Thank you for listening. We'll see you shortly. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir. This podcast is part of Britpod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritpodScene.com or BritpodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.